Welcome to the Birth Launch Podcast, an empowering space for expecting and new parents to hear candid conversations with experts and learn how to craft your ideal birth. We will tackle the scary and weird questions that come up along the way and provide answers that are driven by science and evidence-based recommendations. I'm going to show you how to redefine parenthood and choose what's best aligned for you and your goals. With 10 years of experience in family education and a master's degree in human development and family studies, I'm ready to help you navigate pregnancy and explore your birth options to free yourself of fear surrounding childbirth. My goal is to help you have an informed and confident labor experience, plus an empowered and joyous postpartum. Hello, have you heard about my completely free class that teaches you six evidence-based ways to avoid a C-section and reduce your tearing in labor by up to 50%? And remember, I mentioned it was completely free. This class is going to teach you how to advocate for your preferences in the birth room so that you can have a birth that's filled with joy and not birth trauma. Advocating for yourself starts with being empowered with the right information so that you can ask the right questions and confidently make decisions during labor based on what feels good to you and your baby. But here's the thing. The U.S. has one of the highest C-section rates in the world, and it is ever climbing year after year. And it's not because the system is broken, albeit it is, but it's really because women don't have the tools to navigate that broken system. We may not be able to change the system before you have your baby, but what we can do is change how you operate within that system. Change the conversations that you're having with your providers. Change the places that you are getting your information to help you have informed conversation with your doctor before you have your baby. I want to teach you how to do that. We know the reasons that our C-section rates are climbing. We know the reasons that inductions happen so often, and we know the reasons that babies end up in the NICU. I want to help you avoid all of that so that you can have a birth that you love. You can find my free class at thebirthlounge.com backslash C-section so that you can learn six evidence-based ways to avoid a C-section and reduce your tearing in labor. Again, that is thebirthlounge.com backslash c-section see you there bye taylor welcome to the show thank you thank you so much for having me i was so excited to have you on the show today and to share this conversation with our listeners i think that the topic of online bullying is something that has touched probably every single household maybe across the world, I was going to say in America, but maybe across the world at some point or another in some sort of fashion. I'm not a mom, so I don't get mom shamed or like mom bullied, but I have strong opinions and I'm in a contra industry, right? One that brings out really strong and intense feelings in people. And so I get bullied and and hate and all sorts of stuff on the internet all the time. Sometimes just opening yourself up to the internet, it just kind of comes with that. Where do we even begin? I think I want to just hand over the mic and say, like, take it from here. Like, mom bullying and shaming and online stuff. Yuck. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, I think, oh, this is such a complicated discussion. I feel like a lot of people don't even fully understand what mom shaming is, Mm. what bullying is, because we see a lot of accusations of, well, you're mom shaming because you're sharing information or you're mom shaming because you're not validating my decision. And then on the flip side of that, a lot of times what we have now is the people who are accusing like online educators, for example, of mom shaming are then actually shaming and bullying the people that they're accusing of shaming and bullying. So it's like this like upside down topsy-turvy like crazy thing that doesn't even make sense like I get shamed and bullied I get told you're an awful person you're irresponsible because you're shaming you should be ashamed yes. of yourself. I mean that's literally the <laughs> definition of shaming and so I think it's this really interesting like disconnect or I don't know what it is exactly because like sure there are absolutely people online that talk about certain topics that do shame and do mm-hmm. say for example sleep training right I talk mm-hmm. a lot about sleep training There are people online that say you're a bad mom if you sleep train or you're neglecting your kids if you sleep train. But like, that's not what I say. I don't say those things. I don't think those things. Like truthfully, I think most parents 
are doing the best they can with the information that they have. And the problem is they don't have access to good information. So when I educate online about sleep training, for example, I'm saying this is what babies need. This is what babies expect. This is what happens when you sleep train. Here's what you need to know before you make a decision. That's not shaming. Shaming is actually speaking about the character of a person because of a choice that they're making. It's making a judgment about the person, not the the behavior, not the action, not the decision. But then you have people that get offended and have some hurt like deep down in them. Maybe they don't feel confident in their decisions. And so they're taking it as shaming. It's just really interesting. Like just because you might feel some shame reading a piece of information doesn't mean that you're being shamed. But then they're they're shaming you for sharing information. It's just really crazy. I don't know. It's just really wild. It's hard to wrap your head around, I think. It gives me a little insight into their childhood. It makes me think that someone treated them that way. And so they learn that that's the way that you treat others or you respond to certain triggers or feelings in your body. And so that's what they pass on to others. And it's like this vicious cycle until they come across someone like you or I who has already done that work. We've dealt with our traumas. We have tuned into that emotional intelligence. Not that we're perfect. Like everyone works every day to dial this in, but it takes someone to stop that pattern. And I also think a lot of it is fueled by generations that haven't dealt with those traumas, that don't understand their emotions, that suppress their emotions. They don't have that emotional intelligence. They are fearful to talk about emotions and feelings and traumas and past experiences and Maybe things that they did do wrong because they were doing the best they could with the tools that they had at the time. Those are hard conversations and not everybody is willing to have that conversation so that they can have yeah. that, you know, it's like awareness of yourself. It really is. Yeah. Oh, that's totally 100% what you said. I actually made a post about this a while back that, you know, it's interesting that the people who come to me and accuse me of shaming and call me names and tell me I don't deserve to be here educating parents and all of this stuff. They're saying these things to me. They're shaming me because they, for some reason, feel shamed. And it's almost like it, it does. Like you said, it clues me into maybe how they were raised and how our society and just in general treats people and you know children and adults yeah. for making mistakes. Because in general, our mainstream parenting tactics and strategies is to shame children when they are when they make a mistake, when they do something they shouldn't be doing. It's the good child versus the bad child. You're a good child if you make all the right choices and you're kind and respectful and you listen and you obey. You're a bad child if you're disobedient, if you question, if you say something that, you know, your parents don't agree with. And so it's really for me, it's these adults now coming at me, like coming out at me with these like childhood patterns, right? That they were raised with. They think that because I'm maybe questioning or challenging a decision that they've made, I'm saying they're bad because that's what they maybe were told growing up, right? You make a decision I don't agree with, you're a bad kid. So now I'm saying that to them. That's how they perceive it, right? You're a bad mom because you're making this decision and I am disagreeing with it, but that's not what I'm saying. And so then it's almost like these adults feel this pain of thinking that somebody thinks they're bad or they're wrong or they're not a good enough parent. And then they want to shift the pain away from themselves. And so they shift it onto another person. And that person is usually the person that they perceive has hurt them, yeah. right? So it's just really, really interesting when in reality, I never said they were bad. I never yeah. shamed them. I never called them names, but they're now doing that to me. And they're actually becoming the person that they are criticizing and that they don't like, right? They're doing the very same thing that they're attacking somebody else thinking that they're doing, right? Does that make sense? Of course it makes sense. Like, do, so do you take the time to 
like educate people in your comment section and say like, actually what you're doing is shaming me. So I don't, and this may be, this may be selfish. Maybe I will change my mind as I grow deeper in, in kind of my emotional intelligence for myself. But right now in the space that I'm in, I don't have the time or the emotional capacity to teach people in my comment section and the people in my comment section that leave nasty things like that all too often don't follow me. Don't know who I am. This is the first post you've ever run across. So like you you're not like the right person for this community anyway. So A, I'm not too upset that you're upset with me. And B, I don't expect you to stick around. The people who have been there for a while, they kind of know who I am, right? And you can only fit so much into 200 characters or whatever we're allowed on social media. So I, for those people, I just like don't engage them. So how do you respond to those things in your comments? Because it's hard. I think a lot of people forget that we're human on the other side. That shit hurts sometimes yeah. when you see it. I've cried over so many yeah. comments. Oh, oh. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, this is really, the way I handle these types of comments has really shifted a lot over the years. I used to get a lot more of these comments, but mm. a few years ago, I actually limited my comments comments to just followers because right. that made sense to me like people that are already following me that are in this community can comment but like I don't want the random person who's coming they've seen one post and they're assuming a lot about me most of these comments are very assumptive and I don't want to deal with it but I am the type of person that I really like to argue and I really <laughs> like to have the last word and I'm working on that because I don't want to be that person like I really want to be able to let things go but so I do often educate. I mean, I try to be respectful, but like if somebody says something like accuses me of shaming, I'll usually just say there's nothing shaming here or yeah. I'm not shaming or here is what shaming is. This is education, right? Something like that. I try not to get too emotionally involved because I've found that a lot of people, they really want that. Like they yeah. want that emotional reaction from you. And so I try to just like, I try to just share reality. I'm like, these are the facts. This is what I'm sharing. I'm educating. It's fine for me to do so. You are welcome to leave if you don't like it. So I try to just be very like straightforward, unemotional. Of course, sometimes I do let them the comments get to me. It's It's been a work in progress. I mean, I've been on yeah. social media for about six years and it was really hard for me at first. Like I said, I got a lot of these comments in the beginning and it was tough for me. Like I mm. grew up with this kind of shaming. I grew up with like very manipulative language, like manipulating, man manipulating me in that telling me I'm doing something wrong mm -hmm. when I'm not actually doing something wrong. And so I'm like, I'm very immune to that. Like I, it doesn't work for me, but it does make me mad. Yeah. Because it, for me, it's more of a justice thing. I have like a yes. justice complex. I'm like, yes. this is not right. And it bothers me that people think they can treat people like this. And so that <laughs> is usually why I respond because I want people to know, hey, this is not okay. And you do not get to treat me like this. Yeah. I so, love that. You're speaking yeah. directly <laughs> to my soul right now. <laughs> It's called boundaries. I mean, I yeah. have a lot of boundaries. I'm like, Let if you're going to continue. <laughs> yeah. And that's what I often say too. Like if someone will continue to just like make assumptive comments and accuse me of things that I'm not doing, then I will usually say, look, I have a boundary on my page that you need to like give me the benefit of the doubt. If you're mm -hmm. making assumptions about me, if you're mm -hmm. name calling me, if you're being disrespectful and attacking me, I'm going to block you. So if this continues, I'm going to block you for my page. Mm -hmm. And I think that's reasonable because like yeah. nobody needs to deal with that all the time from strangers. People, they don't even know. We don't even know these people. Yeah. Most of these people, you don't even know their first name. Like you can't even see what they look like because their little picture on their Instagram is so teeny. It's just wild the way people treat each other online. Yeah. I think it's a, a bunch of like bots or I think it's a bunch of people who I'm not even gonna be nice I'm like trying to figure out a nice way to say it. I think it's a bunch of losers online who like are unhappy about their life and like I don't typically call people losers but like people who are just making fake profiles like trolls to like upset people that's annoying don't be that person yuck like no hate but you are yeah. if you're doing that Oh, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's a lot of people like that online. Yeah. But especially in like the parenting world, the birth world, the sleep world, whatever it is, I do think there's just a lot of really hurt people yeah. who are just not confident in their decisions because they're just kind of doing what their pediatrician has told them to, what their OB has told them to, what their mom or their friends have told them to. And they're not really, they're often not 
making conscious choices. They're not like really informed. And so when they first see a piece of information that seems to go, and and I think they're just, there's a lot of insecurity at the root Mm -hmm. of it. And so Mm -hmm. when they see someone that has an opinion or is sharing information that goes against, like is in opposition to choices they've made, they lash out. They can't handle that. And of course, some people are making informed decisions. Some people Mm -hmm. need to sleep train, for example. Like some people really do feel, even though they don't think sleep training is ideal, they feel like they need to sleep train to save their lives or to, you know, and that's reasonable. Like I'm not here to tell a parent that you can't make that decision, Mm -hmm. Uh, but it doesn't negate the facts, right? It doesn't mean we have to stop sharing the facts. And I think there's kind of this societal trend right now of like, it's like trendy to shield people from the truth to protect feelings. Like it's trendy to kind of lie to ourselves and just be like, we accept everything and we're tolerant of every decision and every decision is equal just to protect people's feelings and to make people feel comfortable. And like, that's just not what I'm here for. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm not here to like lie and distort reality and pretend that there's not like objective reality and truth in order to protect the feelings of adults. It's yeah. not what I'm here for. So it's just interesting. Like we're kind of expected to just be tolerant of everything mm-hmm. and everyone. And like every decision is the same and every decision is not the same, but like that's objectively true that every decision is not the same. Some, all decisions have pros and cons. We all weigh those pros and cons when we're making decisions. We all judge decisions we have to judge the and there's this there's this other like thing that's thrown out of you're being so judgmental. Well, we're all judgmental. How do we make it through life without being judgmental? Judgment is a part of life. We have to judge behaviors, Everything. actions. We have we have to judge those things. That's totally. how we make decisions. Yes. How do you make decisions about what you want to feed your kid? How do you make decisions about how you want to raise them? How do you what make decisions safe? about whether you want to have a safe? Yeah. Yeah. Like like you have to judge. The difference is that people take it really personally and they think that Mm. you're judging them as a person. Some people are judging people as people. I try not to do that. When I'm, you know, making posts, when I'm sharing education, I'm not judging the people that are making decisions. I'm judging the actions. I'm judging the way we treat children. Mm. I'm judging, I'm judging actions a lot of times that I still make myself. Like, you know, I talk about parenting a lot and like, I'm on a journey of like trying to be a better mom, trying to reparent myself so that I can be a better parent to my kids. And I lose my cool a lot. Like I just do. And I will talk a lot about how like obviously yelling isn't okay for our kids. Like it's not the best case scenario to be screaming at our kids all the time and losing our cool. I'll talk about that, right? But at the same time, I'm on this journey where I'm struggling with that too. And I still lose my patience. I still get angry with my kids and parent in a way that is not in alignment with my values. That doesn't mean I'm judging myself as a parent. I'm judging the action and I'm talking about it. And how do we grow as people and as parents unless we are talking about these things? Yeah. But it's almost like we're a lot of people don't want us to be talking about these things and having open conversations anymore. It's just everything goes and everybody's fine. And we shouldn't like shame. It's just, it's just, it's exhausting, honestly. Yeah. I love that you separate the people from the action because when you were talking about, we have to judge, I said people. And I was thinking judging people who are safe to be around, not safe to be around people who you want to associate with. And you don't want to associate with people who you agree and you don't agree whether you like that person or not. It's a judgment. Do I agree with them? Do I not? But that is more about their actions. Yeah, that's interesting. Wow, to think that so much of this could be solved if everyone had the tools and the resources and access to like deal with those traumas and deal with your own like inner child, that inner child voice and deal with just past experiences that impact the way that you see and respond to the world. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think that's a huge part of it. Like we have to be able to assess our decisions Mm. and assess whether we're making good choices or whether we're making the best choices we can be, whether we're treating people the best way we can. We all have to do that. And I do that all the time. Like on a daily basis, I'm at the end of the day, I'm like, okay, how did I treat my kids today? That wasn't like the way that I wanted to. How can I do this differently tomorrow? What actions can I take right now? 
so that I improve tomorrow, so that I am kinder to my kids, so that I listen more to them? How can I respectfully discipline them more effectively rather than just resorting to like controlling techniques? We all really should be doing this every day, even with my husband, like with really other relationships, not just my kids. I'm like, okay, was I a good wife today? Was I a good spouse? Did I, is there anything I can do to support my husband better? And I think it's kind of scary, honestly, that a lot of people aren't self-reflecting like that and don't want to self-reflect and just want to be told you're amazing. You're doing the best you can. And I do think for the most part, a lot of us are doing the best we can, but within that we can also grow. We can also yeah. improve. And like, what does it say about our culture that when, when people can't deal with the fact that they're not perfect, it's almost like, like, I know that I'm not perfect. I, I know nobody's perfect. We all can grow. But I think a lot of people have been told you are perfect just the way you mm. are. And everybody needs to validate them. Otherwise, they don't know what to do. And I just think that's kind of scary because if we're not constantly self-reflecting on our actions and how we treat people then where do we go from here? If yeah, everything is just okay. Yeah, like it's okay to act however you want to act, however you want to treat people, however you want to raise your kids, everything is okay. Where do we go from there? How do we grow? How do we do better for our kids? It's a little frightening to me. Yeah. Ooh, that is really frightening to think about it on such a grand scale as like a societal issue and thinking about, you know, like, how did we get here and where do we go? So is this the idea of the snowflake idea or that everyone is soft or is this actually selfishness? What, what do you think is, is it a combination of all of it? I don't know. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, that's a really good question. I just, I don't know. I, I kind of feel like maybe part of it is that it's almost like we've swung the pendulum. So like, you know, years and years ago, a couple decades ago, whatever, I feel like people were really hard and tough on people. And like, there wasn't yeah. really room for mistakes yeah. and kind of that sort of mentality. And I feel like there was obviously like this, this societal response to that that toughness and like not leaving room for mistakes. And it's kind of almost swung to the opposite end of the extreme where now it's like, you can make mistakes and it's fine. You're still perfect the way you are. And it's like, there's all the room for mistakes. And now we're not even gonna, gonna call them mistakes. We're not even gonna say you made a mistake or you're not doing, you know, like everything is just equal. You can make whatever decision you want. It doesn't matter who you hurt. It doesn't matter, like it just doesn't matter. All that matters is you, you do you, you're happy. As long as you're happy and you're doing what's best for you, that's fine. And it seems like the opposite end of the extreme for me. Whereas maybe like what would have been better is if we kind of just stopped in the middle and it was like, okay, we have room for mistakes and you're not a bad person just because you make a mistake and you can like redeem yourself from that mistake. You can use that mistake to grow as a person and to learn from it. But I don't really see that as often. I feel like that is a rare mentality these days to like just accept your mistake without beating yourself up about it and see how you can grow from it. And again, I think part of it goes back to this shaming that a lot of us were raised with. Anytime you made a mistake, you're awful, you're terrible, you're bad, you need a spanking, right? Versus now it's like the opposite of that. It's like maybe we've just totally taken any like sh any shame. And I think that shame and guilt sometimes is fine too. Like there's, an there's another side of it. If you're really doing something that you shouldn't be doing, maybe it's okay to feel a little bit of guilt. Maybe it's okay to feel a little bit of shame. Like that's a signal that, hey, we should reflect on what we're doing and maybe do something differently. Like, I don't think that shame and guilt is always bad, if that makes sense. But I think we've gone to the opposite side of the extreme where people can't even handle any normal human emotions and feelings like shame and guilt when they're doing something that isn't ideal. But yeah, like I don't really know how we've gotten there, like why it's come so far. Well, it seems like they kind of go hand in hand. So you have to have self-reflection to have that motivation to do better. But then in conjunction with that, and almost, well, I guess maybe not for everybody, but in conjunction with that, you need that societal, you know, accountability. 
of keeping you growing and moving forward and saying, you are really great the way that you are, but you can do better. Everyone should always be striving to do better, but I do know that's just not some people's personalities. Not everybody is always striving to do better. Some people are totally content with where they are. For sure. Yeah. So what do you think about the shaming videos online? And I guess let me loop in the embarrassing videos as well. The one that has come to mind right now is the one where they're cracking eggs on people's kids' foreheads. Some children Mm -hmm. laugh hysterically and they find it really, really funny. And it was a joyous experience for that parent. That was the first video I came across. So I thought it was a joyous thing. It was the cutest little boy. I actually shared it on my stories. He laughed so hard. His mom was laughing. They were laughing. They were just laughing uncontrollably. Other videos I've seen, kids are crying. They're like scared. The really emotionally intelligent ones just remove themselves from the situation. Like, I cannot believe I was just disrespected like that. Yeah. What are your thoughts on that? And also, why do you think there are two types of children? What what do you think produces a child that's going to laugh in that situation versus a child that's going to be like, I cannot believe that just happened to me or be scared, be frightened? So, I mean, this is so complex. I don't, I actually just like heard about this. I know this has been going on for probably like a week, at least a week, but I hadn't seen any of these videos. I was mostly seeing like responses to these videos, Mm. but then I started seeing a few of them where like the child is crying. And I just, first of all, I take issue with uh, using our children to get clicks and likes. I take issue with that, like pretty much at all. But at the same time, like if if your child likes it, if your child is enjoying something like that, I think what's important is consent. Like I would personally not do this to my child without asking, hey, I have this cool idea. Can can I try something with you? And like asking them for permission and kind of telling them what's going to happen. Because I think if a child... If a child is going to enjoy it, they're going to enjoy it even if they know it's going to happen. And I think it's better to ask for consent first. But for the kids that get really upset about it, I mean, it makes sense. It makes sense that they're upset because they're entering into this situation where they're really excited because they think they're going to have this one-on-one connected moment with their parent cooking with them. And I mean, gosh, I have kids, I have two young kids and like, they get so excited when they get to help me in the kitchen. And I know that if I did something like that to them, I mean, I think both of them would be devastated and confused and it would be like a trust thing, like a broken trust thing, right? Like, and then for that parent to post it online after their child has had such a big reaction, like, I think it's one thing to go into it just being like, oh, I want to try this, this thing. It'll be funny. I saw it online. And then you're not realizing how your child is going to respond and you, you mess up and your child doesn't like it. And that's one thing you can repair yes. from that. You can apologize, but then posting that reaction online Intentionally. Is what kills me. Yes. Like, you know, your child hated that moment and struggled with it and cried and was scared. And you're posting it online now for everybody to see like that to me is disturbing. Why children might have very different responses. I mean, I think this is a huge part of this is just their temperament and personality. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's, it's. Talk, I always I always make everything go back to like sleep because that's my specialty. But this is the same with sleep. It's like, why do some kids just, just fuss a little bit when they're being sleep trained and then go right back to sleep? And why do some kids vomit and throw up and they'll scream and cry for hours and hours and hours? It's a temperament issue. Some children are just really, really sensitive and feeling and some kiddos are not. Like some kiddos are less sensitive and they're just like, you know, they're, I don't know. It's just a difference in personality. Some children just like, and people too. I mean, it's the same for adult and people. I say people like children are people, adults, <laughs> adults and children. Some adults and children are just very sensitive and perceptive to what's going on around them. And so they might perceive that experience to be hurtful versus some might just think it's cool and funny and whatever, you know, especially if their parent seems like they're laughing about it and they're having a good time. That child might just be like, oh, this is a fun thing. Whereas other children won't. So, yeah, I mean, I think that's pro- that probably explains the difference. It's just difference in personalities and temperaments. But, yeah, I'm just – I'm not a fan. Like, I'm not a fan of exploiting our children for likes at all. And I think this is, like, 
you know, one of the things that really I struggle with the disconnect for people here. I've also seen videos of like responses to this whole egg cracking thing about saying like, you know, this isn't a kind thing to do to our kids. We shouldn't be doing this to our kids. And then I'll read a comment and somebody's like, well, your mom's shaming right now. Like if that mom wants to do it, she can do it. And I'm just thinking, why is mom shaming not okay? Which this isn't even mom shaming. This is just saying, hey, this is not a good idea. <laughs> it's not kind to do um, to your you kid can... that you love. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, why is it not? But even if it is mom shaming, why is it not okay to mom shame, but it is okay to child shame? Yeah. Like it is okay to to be unkind and cruel to our kids and then post a video of them crying and devastated online. Like that's okay. I just don't understand why people are more concerned with the feelings of adults making these decisions than they are with the feelings and well-being of kids who are more vulnerable than adults. That is my huge issue with this whole conversation. It's like, even with the sleep training conversation, okay, we don't want to mom shame moms who may have chosen to sleep train, but the moms who have chosen to sleep train are essentially shaming their children for their biologically appropriate and developmentally appropriate needs. They're saying, you shouldn't be hungry at night. You shouldn't be, you shouldn't need me at night. So I'm going to ignore you. Is that not a form of shaming your children? So that's what gets me is like, maybe we can just be okay with speaking out about things that we have concerns about and we don't have to call it shaming. Anyway, sorry, I got off topic there, but no, yeah, so. not at all. I think, I think those are fascinating perspectives. I've never thought about that. It is, it's always those shouldn'ts that kind of get in the way the, well, you shouldn't do this because it makes me feel, you know, a certain way. Uncomfortable. Yeah. yeah. And I don't want to go there. Right. So you shouldn't do what you're doing because I'm uncomfortable with my own feelings. I feel this way about myself. That's what kills me about comments in my section sometimes is, I can see very clearly why my post upset you. And at the end of the day, it has nothing to do with me. It has not a single thing to do with what I said, the words on that screen, the music lyrics used, nothing. It was because when you saw my video, you felt something and you were afraid to go there. And that I think is mm -hmm. one of my biggest lessons I've learned of being online and in that like public space of getting unsolicited opinions is just, I have to discern where did the hurt come from? If I'm responsible for it, I a thousand percent will apologize and I might even delete the video, right? I don't want harmful things out there. I, then that opens up the conversation of, do you delete it or let people, you know, continue to see, you don't want to like cover up your mistakes. I get that too. But if something is harmful, I will delete it. I will take responsibility. I will say, I'm very sorry. I will explain where I was coming from and also how I understand it was harmful, what I'm going to do in the future to, to fix it and make sure I don't go back there. But it's the ones that come and it's like, sister, this is a you problem, honey. Like you got to deal with that yourself. Yeah. I can't help oh, you yeah. with that. Yeah. You know, I think the word narcissism is really overused, but <laughs> I think that there is, I think that there should be, and maybe there is, and I just am unaware. I think there should be like a term for like social media narcissism mm. because I think social media has kind of bred this form of narcissism maybe not like like technical narcissism but it's this form of like this self-centeredness self-absorbedness that like you think people think that they are the center of their little social media world and you know that has been fueled by the algorithm because yeah. when you're on Instagram or TikTok or whatever and you're scrolling your feed, you know, the algorithm is so good that you're often just seeing things that really resonate with you. And so much so that you kind of forget that there are other opinions and experiences and worldviews out there until the algorithm fails a little bit and something comes up on your screen that does not directly validate your life choices, your decisions, your belief systems, et cetera. And so then that's when people get angry. And I really do think that social media and the algorithm and the way it all works has kind of facilitated this weird version of narcissism where it's like people feel like they have to comment on, they have to express their opinion on this stranger's Instagram post, even though it doesn't relate to them. 
And it's really interesting to me because like I could be sharing something just even about my own personal experiences or decisions. I remember, oh my gosh, one of the posts that like I got so much heat from that I wasn't expecting was a post I made a couple years ago about Santa and how I, I said, this is our approach. This is how we handle Santa. We don't really do Santa, but this is how we navigate it. And this is what we do. And it went viral. I did not expect it to. I had people so angry and they were saying basically like, you are attacking me. <laughs> you are attacking me by sharing your, what your parenting choices about Santa. And for me, I'm like, wait, so I can't even share my own personal perspective and choices and like thought process in making those parenting choices. And now it's about you, even though it was really about me. Like how does something that's about me and my experience become about a perfect stranger who I've never met and don't even know their first name? Like that to me is a crazy form of narcissism that people think that that is how it works. Like you can just see a stranger's post and it's all of a sudden about you. That's wild to me, but it is, it's like this, this self-absorption, right? Like everything has to be about me, not, and not just me, like me. I'm talking about like in general, people feel this way. A lot of people feel this way. And I think social media has had a lot to do with it to like create this little world where you're the center of it. And you have to comment on anything that does not directly speak to you that you do not love. It's very strange. And that's the other thing is, you know, I might share about like encouragement for parents who don't want to sleep train, who are co-sleeping, who want to continue to do that. And these parents often need encouragement and they need some education and some validation because they're living in a culture where largely they're not receiving that. They're basically being told what you're doing is wrong. And so that's kind of like my corner of the internet. I'm here to support parents and provide encouragement for parents who don't want to sleep train and who maybe bed share. And I'll get people like come onto these posts and be like, well, this makes me feel offended because I don't bed share. And I'm like, okay, like then this post isn't for you. Maybe not all posts <laughs> are for you. Oh, on. Like, <laughs> yeah, right. Like this post is obviously like, look at the comments. This post maybe feels really encouraging or helpful or resonates with a lot of other people. Like you probably have several corners on the internet where you can go to and feel validated in your decisions and encouraged in your decisions. And this corner of the internet is maybe for not you, for somebody else, right? It's just interesting to me. It's like, we can't have our own our own space to like share our perspective, our worldview, our parenting choices, but you can have yours. It's just, it's bizarre. Like it let is. people have their corners of the internet, you know? <laughs> yeah. I've never understood people who don't have the capacity to scroll on without commenting. That's just like not who I am. I don't spend a lot of time commenting online. I don't spend a lot of time commenting on people that I love and know and care for. So I definitely don't do it for strangers. Yeah. I just, I've never understood it. Like, I think it's jealousy. I think I am jealous that you have the time to sit and spend scrolling the internet, commenting on shit you know nothing about, on people you don't follow. Honestly, good for you that you have all yeah. that time. I'm like, you know, I just don't, that's just not who I am. I will never, ever understand it. I don't but either. I don't anyway. either. You know, I, in six years of being on in the online space, I think that I've commented at like a disagreeing comment on a post one time mm. because it, it, it like was so just outrageously, I think, harmful to the bed sharing community. And I actually regretted commenting and I did it respectfully, mm -hmm. but like, other than that, I make it a point. I do not comment. I do not tr I try not to follow people that are often posting things I disagree with. Like I'll, I follow some yeah. people that I don't agree with about everything, but like if they're posting things that like make me angry or dysregulated every day, I'm like, okay, it's time to unfollow because this yep. is not worth my energy. They are allowed to have their opinions. Yes. They are allowed to have their perspective and share that in their space. And I do not have to choose to view it, right? I don't have to choose to be dysregulated every day by it. So I feel like that's a personal like accountability thing. Like know your own triggers, know what's causing you to be dysregulated and remove that from your life. But I think part of the problem is one, social media, the way, again, back to the algorithm, the way it works is that it kind of likes dysregulation, right? Mm -hmm. It likes things that are really controversial, posts that are really controversial, posts that cause a lot of anger. And that's what it, the algorithm will often show people more often than just the like neutral post or the 
the encouraging post or whatever. And so I think like people in general are a little bit addicted to dysregulation. I think they yeah. like, I think a lot of people like to argue and like to get into like comment battles and things like that. And I get it. Cause sometimes I've been there. Sometimes I like, even in my own comment section, I'm like, okay, someone just responded this to me and I responded back. And now I have to constantly refresh to see when they respond to me. And it's very dysregulating, but it's yeah. like, I think a lot of us who were raised in very dysregulated homes, it's kind of this messed up thing. To us. It feels comfortable to us. Oh, and we yeah. have to really work on not engaging in those dysregulating behaviors and battles and, and things like that. But yeah. I get it, but I'm more aware of it, I think, than a lot of people are. And a lot of people will just kind of succumb to that. I want to be dysregulated and fight people all the time. Yeah. Yeah, it does. It takes a certain level of of self-awareness and I've I too am really good at that now in terms of social media and comments and things like that, but it was learned, right? You're a lot of us are not taught this as children. Some of us are. Some of us were blessed that we had really great emotionally intelligent you know, stable parents, but not all of us. And that's okay if that wasn't you, but just be aware of it. Just like you said, know what your triggers are, know what sets you off, know how you can calm your system back yeah. down, look into options that you can do instead of, you know, losing your shit. What else could you do instead? Yeah. Um, okay. So yeah. The easiest thing to do is just to take a deep breath and step away from the internet for a few minutes. Because one of the issues is that people often aren't actually, like they're reading comprehension is pretty flawed when they're on social media like people will see something and they'll think it is like the intent is something maybe different than it is and they'll just get like really reactive and angry and they'll completely misinterpret the meaning of the post so I'm mm -hmm. constantly responding to comments where I'm like I didn't say that please go back and read the caption because they just literally are saying things like they're arguing points that I didn't make but mm -hmm. they're like so reactive that they're they're not able to comprehend correctly. So I'm like, just go take a few minutes away and then come back and reread it. And maybe you'll find that you don't even have really that reason to be angry that you thought maybe you did. Or maybe you forget about it altogether and you never even revisit it. Yeah, don't even come back. Go. Just yeah. ignore it. And that's what I do a lot of times. Mute. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. exactly. Absolutely. Exactly. Okay, I do have a question about something you said earlier. So you said that shame and guilt are not always bad. I too agree with that, right? But I would love for you to give us an example of maybe a time that it would be appropriate to use it and how you would deliver that. Because while shame and guilt are not always bad, there are many ways you can deliver them that can turn a good opportunity to use that as a teaching moment into something that actually leaves that child with some sort of emotional trauma because we delivered it wrong or too harshly. Oh, yeah. So I would say that I am not referring to shaming or guilting somebody. I am saying that feeling shame or guilt for an action that you did is not always wrong. So like an example of this is that my daughter, she's six. She lately has been feeling ashamed when she hurt somebody. Yes. And I try I don't always succeed, but I try not to shame her and guilt her. I try to just handle it pretty neutrally, like remove her from the situation if needed, tell her so-and-so is hurt. What can you do to make it better? You're angry. You hurt so-and-so. Let's make it better. But she'll like go into her room and cry and close the door and like she'll be really embarrassed and ashamed. And I think that it is appropriate for her to feel that way. I'm not trying to deliver that to her, like saying you should be ashamed of yourself, but it is just a natural consequence mm -hmm. that when you do something that hurts another person, you should feel or you might feel a little bit ashamed or a little bit guilty. And I think that is something that we can grow from because it's an uncomfortable feeling and we don't want to feel it. And so I think it's a signal to us to reflect on our actions. I'm not saying that I think we should shame or guilt somebody. I'm just saying that. I think it's appropriate sometimes to feel those feelings and then respond to them. Okay, like, yeah, why not, do I feel ashamed right now? You're yeah. not stopping them from feeling those heavy, uncomfortable feelings that I think a lot of our parents did stop us. And so now as adults, yeah. as parents, we don't know how to handle that. And a lot of times it comes out in us shaming our children when in fact, the delivery is holding space for them. Yes, letting them know that what they did was not right. And you might even, I don't know how you feel about this, but you might even say something like, 
that was not kind. Let them know why what they did mm -hmm. wasn't okay. Especially if it's something that they've struggled with with a long time. You can just say like, that's not nice. We cannot do that. You cannot hit other people. You cannot bite other people when you get angry. But yeah, that delivery of that shame is so important that you don't add to what they're already feeling. You're holding space. You're letting them know you, you see them, but that it's okay to feel these big feelings. Yeah. I tell my children that I it went like, especially my, my six-year-old is the one who is really now feeling like she'll feel embarrassed and she'll feel ashamed. And I say, you know, it's okay that you feel that way. It's normal yeah. to feel that way when you hurt somebody. And I will often give her an example of a time. Maybe I felt that way because mm. I hurt somebody or I hurt somebody's feelings. And I'll say, you know, I feel ashamed when I do this too. And that's okay. And it helps us understand that what we did wasn't the right thing to do. And then we can work on making a, making a kinder choice next time. So yeah, I mean, I just, I try to normalize all of those feelings because yeah, like you said, I think a lot of times parents will try to prevent their child from experiencing those really big feelings. And really like, those are all a part of just being a human and just mm -hmm. being alive and they, yep. they're, they're teaching moments. Exactly. And so we don't, we don't need to, they're not negative, right? I think society as a whole, like most people kind of lump feelings into positive feelings and negative feelings and the negative feelings we don't want to feel, but really they're all part of life and they're all kind of neutral. They're just feelings and they're a, a signal, like a message, a messenger to us to, to figure out what we're, why we're feeling the way we're feeling and, and how our behaviors impacted those feelings or how somebody else's behaviors maybe impacts those feelings, right? Like there's so many reasons we have emotions. And um, so just trying to be comfortable and okay with any emotion that comes up and just being kind of, I like to think of it as being, especially when we're talking about our kids, we're the containers for mm -hmm. our kids to ex express their emotions and to be a safe place for them to express it. We're not telling them, oh, you shouldn't feel embarrassed or you shouldn't. That's the other thing too. I think some parents will say, you don't need to feel ashamed. You don't need to feel embarrassed. And I think that, I mean, then that kind of sends this message that maybe there's something wrong with them because they do feel ashamed. Hmm. Well, if, you know, if I don't need to feel ashamed, but I do feel ashamed, maybe I'm doing something wrong or there's something wrong with me. It's okay to feel ashamed. You know, it's okay. It'll pass. You can say it'll pass, but it's okay to feel ashamed when you do something that you're not proud of. Yeah, I think there's a big difference and you should ask yourself, are you using shame and guilt in the moment as a teaching moment in the natural capacity that it arises or are you using it to manipulate your child in some sort of right. way, right? So using shame and guilt as a teaching moment is natural because it's a natural emotion, but using it to manipulate them to get an outcome that you want, not natural, not okay. Big Absolutely. Difference. 100%. Yes. And I would take this back, like to kind of make it come full circle to what we've been talking about from the beginning about this, like shaming, this idea of shaming in the online space is like, I don't really say this to adults, but I think it sometimes, or sometimes I have said it in other words. Like if you are feeling ashamed because of a piece of information that I shared with you or that you read on my page, it's okay to feel that. That's a message. Maybe you should reflect on why you feel ashamed because I did not shame you. But it's okay to feel that feeling. Sometimes we can use that as a, as fuel for growth. Likewise, like you just said, you know, it's there's a difference between just naturally feeling shame versus using shame kind of as this manipulation tactic to control somebody. The people that will scream at you, you're mom shaming because you're saying something I don't like. You should be ashamed of yourself. You're dangerous, blah, 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 right? That is actually using a manipulation tool of shaming and, and things like this to try to control somebody, to try to silence somebody. So those are two very different experiences. When you read a piece of information, like, so for example, if I, you know, followed somebody on Instagram and they said, Chick-fil-A has really unhealthy ingredients. Maybe you should rethink feeding your kids Chick-fil-A. That person isn't shaming me. We love Chick-fil-A. We eat pretty healthy most of the time, but we do go to Chick-fil-A sometimes. Love it brings us joy. We live an 80-20 lifestyle. We're not perfect. I, mean, I don't stress about everything being perfect. If I read that post and I felt shame, that person isn't shaming me. They're just sharing information, but that's my opportunity to reflect on why I feel ashamed and whether I need to act on that shame. I would say I can feel shame reading that and then I can reflect and think, you know what? We eat pretty healthy most of the time. I'm okay with going and taking my kids to Chick-fil-A every once in a while. 
And that is a natural occurrence of shame versus if I typed in the comments, you're shaming me and you should be ashamed of yourself. And you're just, you know, irresponsible and all of this stuff to this person that wrote the Chick-fil-A post. That is me shaming them to try to control them, to get them to stop posting the information that they're posting, which is yeah. not okay. Yeah. So people need to know the difference. Like they yeah. really do. They really need to understand the difference. Yeah. That's why I wanted to ask the question of using it as a teaching moment and how that delivery is done in an interaction between a child and a parent versus using it in as a tactic, right? One, like yeah. I say, you're using the natural kind of experience of it versus using it as a tactic. Yeah. I think that's really important. I think shaming is for so many people, their first defense. It's like immediately where they go. Oh, and yeah. It takes a lot of hard work to unwrite that in your system, right? To to untangle all of yeah. that and to relay absolutely some sort of different foundation. It's tricky. And like I'm still working on it as yeah, a parent. Same. My first instinct is always to shame because I, that's I was just shamed growing up. Just everything I was shamed, everything. I'm still shamed as an adult by my mother. So <laughs> It's very natural for me to want to resort to shame. And I do sometimes, and it's not right of me, right? Like this is an area where I have, I'm still working on this and I'm still trying to grow. But yeah, it's, it's not that shame itself is a bad feeling. It's just that we shouldn't use shame as a control manipulation tactic. Yeah. 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 For other people on the internet, for yourself, for your children, for nobody, it's just not healthy. There right. are other ways that we can deal yeah. with this. Yeah. And kids don't, kids don't learn by being shamed. Right. That's the other thing. They don't learn by it. I mean, you can control them, but they don't learn by it. And it, it's not an intrinsic motive. It's more of an extrinsic motivation thing that usually isn't very effective in the long term versus like an intrinsic lesson that they've like learned and now they're self-motivated. I like to, I mean, I don't do this all the time. I'm working on it, but like, I think just even just kind of sports casting what's going on. Like if your child did something that they shouldn't have done, um, sports casting, like just narrating objectively, like what you see. So you, you're angry. So-and-so got hurt. What can we do to make it feel better, et cetera? Like trying to be kind of neutral and just talking through what's happened, pointing out what things you're noticing, somebody's feelings are hurt, somebody's crying because they're upset versus using the shaming, which is very biased really I mean it's like biased towards the the you know the negative action of the child or pointing out that that's a negative action of the child and kids don't really learn well from that they just feel embarrassed ashamed threatened maybe they feel insecure in their relationship they don't feel supported and safe it's hard yeah it's hard because that's what most of us were raised with and it is really hard to break free of that pattern yeah. Okay. So how would someone repair something like that with their child if they, A, maybe that is their style and they're just realizing like, oh shit, that's me. <laughs> okay. I gotta, gotta change some things up. Yeah. How do you repair that? Or maybe that's not your style and you just like found yourself in a situation. You did it. You're like, oh, that wasn't great. How are we repairing things with our kids once we mess up? It, it pertaining to like shame and guilt and like making them feel icky about decisions and things yeah. that they do. Yeah. Oh man, this is something that I, I do this every day with my kids. I have to repair oh. every day with them. So I, because I usually will go in and apologize and I'll say, look, you, this is what happened. Here's how I responded. That wasn't okay. You did not deserve to be talked to like that. If I said something kind of shaming or like, you're a bad girl or, you know, whatever it is that would have, I would have said, I would specifically say, I said this and it's not true and it's not your fault. I said it because I was angry. So I try to make it like, it's about me. It's not about you. It's about me. I was feeling really dysregulated and I was having a hard time managing my emotions. So I said something really unkind to you and you did not deserve it. And this is not true what I said. And then I'll also usually try to give them kind of an action step of like what I'm going to do to try to change that for next time. Yeah. Something like that. Like next time I, when this happens, here's how I'm going to handle it. Or I'm going to take a deep breath and take a few moments away so that I can calm down before I come respond to you or something like that. And then I just always make sure that they know that I love them. I love them no matter what they do. Nothing will make me love them less and that my anger is about me and not them. So that's how I do it. And I do it every day, every single day. 
and I, mean, I asked for forgiveness. So many people in the audience right now that are like, wow, I needed to hear that. Thank you, mom, Taylor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, we all mess up. And I think that's the other thing is like the mo, I mean, we're all going to mess up like as parents, I mean, not even as parents, but we're talking specifically about our kids right now. There's no parent that's perfect. Even all of the respectful parenting educators on Instagram, which I don't even claim to be one of those. I'm not a, like a gentle, respectful parent. I'm working on that, but I'm not. <laughs> so I feel like a fraud when I talk um, about it. But even the people that like seem to have it all together, they mess up still, mm -hmm. maybe not as often as I do, but they still mess up and they're still having to repair. And like yeah. the most important thing is not that you're a perfect parent. It's that your child sees that you try to repair and you try to grow when you make a mistake and that you're not just letting it go. You're not just justifying the nasty things that you said to your child and that they're beginning to believe these things about them are true. Like make sure they know that you said something that wasn't true and it was unkind and it's not about them. It's about you and it's about your own issues. And I mean, I never got apologized to growing up. No, me neither. So I can't tell you, like if my parents had messed up, but then they had come and like truly tried to repair with me and truly acknowledge that what they said and what they did wasn't okay and were trying to grow like I would have so much respect for them I think I think things would have turned out a lot differently it's really yeah. not about being perfect it's about being self-aware and and apologizing and repairing yeah yeah not being apologized to as a child I think has followed a lot of us into yeah. our adulthood it's something I yeah. have just recently kind of discovered about myself and you know this is why I talk so much on the podcast about therapy and digging into yourself and digging into your past and digging into the way that you were parented because it matters it literally shapes you as a human absolutely yeah and you know the other thing about just making sure you're parenting with your children is that it is beneficial to them because because it teaches them how to grow and how to repair themselves. I mean, if you're perfect, which nobody is perfect, but if you're perfect with your kids, they'll never get the opportunity to see imperfection mm. and, and how you respond to your imperfect moments, right? So that's really a beautiful thing too about messing up is that if you mess up and use the opportunity as fuel for growth and repair, then your kids get to observe that and they learn how to do that themselves. Whereas, yeah, like you're saying, a, a lot of us didn't get that growing up. And so we had to learn how to apologize. Like apologizing has always been really hard for me because I yeah, didn't me too. get that at all growing up. I never yeah. heard people truly apologize. We yeah. just like held grudges and nobody apologized. And so like when I married my husband, that was one of the biggest things that I had to work on was releasing my pride and admitting when I did something wrong or hurtful and apologizing for it. And it's still really hard for me. Yeah. I have an easier time apologizing to my kids than I do yeah. my husband. But <laughs> oh my God. yeah, it's still a work in progress, you know. But I think our kids see the our kids see the regret our kids see the remorse and that's so important like I mean we've all been hurt before and I'm sure mm -hmm. like most of us have probably had the experience of being hurt by somebody who just doesn't care and who mm -hmm. never acknowledged that they hurt us versus being hurt by somebody who truly repented and truly felt awful for hurting us and apologized and that's a totally different experience and we could have resulting trauma from the person that hurt us and never, never admitted it, never acknowledged it, just moved on like nothing happened. And we could have like the same amount of hurt, but not the resulting trauma when that person made it right and made it better and they admitted they were wrong. And so that's just a, such a huge thing. This all comes full circle. This conversation about accusing people of mom shaming and not being able to self-reflect on your actions. Like these are the parents that like, they're so afraid to self-reflect, but I worry that they're also doing this in their own, like just parenting life, like their relationship with their kids. They're so reluctant to self-reflect and just want to attack anybody who challenges the decisions that they're making. And are they also doing that with their kids? Because that shows me that maybe they are not open to seeing that they're not perfect and that there's room for growth and there's room for repair and repentance. Mm. And that's not good for a relationship. It's not good for our next generation of kids either. We don't want more kids that grow up with the same wounds that we've all grown up with, not being apologized to, having parents that don't do self-reflection, using right. shaming as a manipulation tactic, things like that. That's we're trying to do better by our kids, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Man, you have, I think, spoken to a lot of people's 
mother wounds out there or their, you know, dad wounds out it's there. My specialty. Um, yeah. Mother wounds is my specialty. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Not really, but. Oh, no, but I do think I do think you do a beautiful job on your social media pages of talking about I'm not going to say controversial because these should not be controversial topics, big feeling topics, topics that that make us feel a lot of things. I think you do it very eloquently and I think you do it in a way ironically that's not shamey. Um and I appreciate your approach. I think that, you know, what you said earlier that you truly are open to letting people choose but you want them to know their options like you don't have to sleep train and also if you choose to sleep train I'm just not the person for you it doesn't mean I'm I'm judging you or I think you're a bad person or I think that you're gonna hurt your kid it's just not what I do and that's totally fine you're welcome to hang out here don't cause trouble and I'm not gonna like right you know, come after you I think you do a great job of that on social media and, and I can tell you I know firsthand obviously it's so hard to strike that balance the internet's a hard place to be on it's a really hard place to be it is hard yeah thank you I appreciate that I try to not perfect but I do try to be pretty balanced. I feel like I do have a pretty balanced. I try to be balanced, but also factual. And, you know, I'm not lying to people. I'm not distorting reality, but I feel like I'm pretty balanced. Like, honestly, I get a lot of pushback from some of the kind of people in this like very pro bed sharing, co-sleeping attachment parenting camp, because I'm not as extreme as they want me to be, Mm. because I think that it's okay for like, moms to to shift patterns. I think it's okay sometimes like if your child will sleep in the crib, like you don't have to bed share, right? If that's like every child is different in what they need, but some parents are going to cri- do crib sleeping and that's fine and that works for them and I'm okay with that and some people really hate yeah. that I won't speak as strongly about things like that. Like, you know, and I'll never say you're absolutely going to harm your attachment with your child if you sleep train. You might, it depends on the child, but I'm never going to say like absolutes like this. And so I get a lot of pushback from the more extreme, like attachment parenting camp as well, because I have a more balanced, like middle of the road view. Like my view is basically parent the child in front of you and do what works for you and the child in front of you. And every child is so different. So you can't make absolute statements about any method of supporting sleep. Yeah. Look, if you stand in the middle of the road, you get hit by both sides. I find myself in the same exact boat. You know, I want people to choose what's best for them in their birth so that you don't have birth trauma. I cannot care less how your child comes out of your body. You should choose whatever is best for you. So at the end of it, you don't walk away broken. And so when I talk about elective C-sections, the natural birth community comes after me. When I talk about home birth after a C-section, the medical community comes after me. So you're never going to please everybody. I appreciate your middle of the road approach. And I'm standing right here beside you. We'll hang out in the middle together. Thank you. Yes. (laughs) Yes. Thank you. (laughs) Taylor, this has been so, dare I say fun to talk about shame and guilt, (laughs) mom bullies and all the things. This has been (laughs) a ton of fun. Really, really. Thank you so much for sharing your perspectives and your experiences. And I think you gave us a lot that we can take and reflect on, which seems to be a topic that continues to pop up through this conversation. I love self-reflection. I do self-reflection a lot constantly. And so I, I think it's a good practice for everybody. If people were interested in connecting with you, either about your sleep or about just being a mom and they would just want to follow along, where can they find you? Yeah. So I'm mostly on Instagram at Taylor Kulik. Uh, My website is taylorkulik.com. I have sleep courses. I do webinars. I have a teammate who offers one-to-one sleep support. And then I also, I have like an email list where I answer questions. I send like motherhood reflections and things every week. So you can sign up for that. I have freebies on my website and I have a podcast. So there's lots of different places. Yeah. Love it. All right, you guys, thanks so much for hanging out with us today. It's been a lot of fun. All the things that we talked about today, all of Taylor's resources will be in the show notes for you guys. And I'll see you next week. Head over to Instagram and follow both Taylor and I. See you next week. Bye.